Good evening and welcome to yesterday's news. Tonight's story, Hamilton's Forgotten Mass Murder, Lloyd Russell's Rampage, June 24, June 4th, 1925, pulled straight from the pages of the Hamilton Journal and the Hamilton Daily News. We all like to think of Hamilton as the quaint, homey place that inspired William Dean Howells at Boys Town essays. But our city has a dark side, too. Hamilton really did earn the name Little Chicago during the Prohibition era as a haven for notorious Chicago gangsters who brought with them their crimes and their vices. But a candidate for the most horrific crime that took place in Hamilton during the 1920s had nothing to do with bootleg liquor or jazz music, but with a hard-working bachelor worried about losing his home because of a mortgage coming due on June 4, 1925. Nearly 50 years later, Hamilton made national news when a 40-year-old loner named James Urban Rupert murdered all 11 members of his family one cold and windy Easter Sunday in 1975. Oddly enough, Rupert and Lloyd Russell both killed his mother, his brother, and his brother's children. In Rupert's case, however, there were no survivors to tell even a portion of what happened in the Minor Avenue home that day. By that time, however, Lloyd Russell's crime had so faded into obscurity that even though it was mentioned in the sidebar in the journal news, it was just a couple of scant paragraphs. Although it was barely June, technically not even summer yet, Hamilton and the rest of the nation was in the midst of a stifling heat wave. Wednesday, June 3rd, was the hottest day of 1925 so far, reaching 105 degrees during the day and not falling below 83 degrees at that night. By 9 a.m., June 4th, the temperature had already climbed to 90, but the neighborhood atop Prospect Hill behind champion-coated paper was buzzing with morbid excitement and curiosity. Crowds were gathered around the house at 220 Progress Avenue, trampling down grass and flowers and peering through every window for a glimpse inside. One woman evaded the police at the door and ran inside for a closer look, a man slipping in behind her, only to collapse in a faint when he came back out seconds later. Reporters from Cincinnati and Dayton newspapers were mingling with the crowd. One Dayton paper sent a reporter and photographer by airplane landing on a strip south of town and rushing to the scene in a taxi cab. The house was owned by Francis Lloyd Russell, 39 years old, who bought the house in 1920 and shared the home with his recently widowed mother, Rose, his brother, John Lowell Russell, his wife, his brother's wife, Emma, and his six nieces and nephews. About four years before the murders, Lowell and his family had moved from Hamilton to Otsego, Michigan, where Rose had some relatives, but they soon returned home and had been living with Lloyd and Rose for about two years. Lloyd seemed like a quiet man, conscientious in his work and never smoked or drank, neighbors said, and he told others that when his brother and his family were living in Michigan, he missed them terribly. This is the place for them to be, he said. The Russell family were excellent neighbors, others commented. They reported never having heard any serious disturbances in the house. Rose was prominent in Hamilton's busy uh, fraternal circles as a council deputy of the Neonatal Council, the degrees of Pocahontas, as well as a prominent member of the Lone Star Temple, the Pythian Sisters, Fort Hamilton Lodge, Daughters of America, Silver Link, and Daughters of Rebecca. Neighbors described the Russells as a close, loving family. As head of the household, Lloyd seemed like a kind and devoted, he seemed kind and devoted. His brother Lowell was a salesman for the Metropolitan Insurance Company and had been stricken with an illness at first thought to be appendicitis. When he was in the hospital, it fell upon Lloyd to support the entire family. <laughs> there is no record of Lloyd ever getting into any trouble, and his acquaintances all spoke highly of him. However, he was a man who did not make close associations outside of his family, but who was always friendly and considerate. Minor C. Millsbaugh testified later that he had known Russell for about 30 years and said the man was, quote, queer about speaking to people not entering into conversations unless he was addressed first. Unlike his mother, who seemed to belong to every club in town, Lloyd Russell had but one membership, the Knights of Pythias, and that was only because they had a mutual aid agreement with 
the Champion Coated Paper Company that paid sick benefits. He worked at the Champion for eight years. He said he picked a hard job for himself, handling cases that weighed between 600 and 1,000 pounds in order to lose some weight. But it didn't work. Russell said that just before the murders, he weighed 248 pounds. I suppose the harder I worked, the more I ate, he said. Russell was also known as a student and a lover of books. He read incessantly and particularly loved poetry. His favorite author was the Hoosier poet James Whitcomb Riley, famous for the verse he wrote about children. The previous summer, Lloyd and two of his friends made a pilgrimage to Riley's home in Greenfield, Indiana, to take photographs of the childhood scenes. Clarence Young, a shipping clerk who worked with Russell at Champion, said Lloyd was a dreamer. Dr. Mark Milliken, who was the first psychiatrist to testify at Russell's sanity hearing, said that as a boy, Russell never played any games, had no social aspirations, and had never attended any parties or sought companionship. He did not dance, and he had no sweetheart. He thought nothing of women, lacking a sex instinct, as one doctor put it. He was egotistical and lacked a sense of humor. Others would describe him as aloof. Until the few days leading up to the murder, Russell was putting in 16 hours a day on two jobs, a half clerical, half labor position at Champion Coated Paper Company, a few blocks east of his home, and a second job at the Ford Motor Company, a plant, uh, the Ford Motor Company plant across the river. With his savings depleted from the cost of supporting the entire family during Lowell's illness, he worked hard in a frantic attempt to pay off the mortgage on the cozy bungalow three shady blocks from Main Street, but he still owed $1,600 that was due Thursday, June 4th. E.J. Inlows, who worked with Russell at the Champion, said he was acting strangely two weeks prior to the tragedy. He was cross and grouchy, and he did not perform his work in the usual careful manner. <coughs> Neighbors recalled seeing Russell poor, uh, pursuing two of his little nephews around the yard a few days prior to the murders. He was acting queerly, they said, shouting and chasing them with two small switches, but they shrugged it off as a man playing with boys. He was so distraught over not having any money that he apparently gave up hope and did not go to either job all that week. He also purchased two cheap handguns, both 32 caliber revolvers. His state of mind may have been exacerbated by the extremely hot weather which had claimed 12 lives in the state of Ohio alone in the days leading up to the incident. But that steamy night, June 3rd, a visiting friend later reported that Lloyd was in the best of spirits, that the family seemed to be one of the happiest. Shortly after the visitor left, however, Lloyd was the first in the household to go to bed. For a troubled man prone to insomnia, an upstairs bedroom in that kind of weather makes for a rough night of tossing and turning. So it's no surprise then that Lloyd was also the first to get up, even before the morning sun. He later said that when he finally got up after not sleeping all night, he wanted to take a cold bath to cool himself off, but was afraid the sound would wake the family, because running water makes so much noise when everything is still and open as it was that night. Nine-year-old Dorothy Louise Russell, Lloyd's niece, was awakened by gunshots and people screaming, children crying. The sound seemed to drag to wind down behind the loud cracks of the gun until there was only the baby brother crying, and then another gunshot made him stop. She was still in bed when her uncle Lloyd pointed his gun at her. She covered her head with pillows as Russell pulled one trigger and then the other, but both hammers fell on empty cartridges. When he stopped to reload, Dorothy grabbed her eight-year-old brother, Robert Clinton, by the hand and ran to the kitchen. Robert ran into a bicycle and it fell on top of him, delaying their escape long enough for Russell to get one of his guns reloaded to fire at the children again, hitting the boy as he struggled with the bike. Dorothy resumed her flight and made her escape out the back door, barefoot and in her nightgown. Russell shot at it, emptying his gun again as he pursued the girl into the street. The Reverend E.S. Comrade of the First United Brethren Church, who lived at the corner of Progress and Ray Avenues across the street from the Russell home, told reporters from the Hamilton Evening Journal that at about 5.40 a.m., 
He and his wife were awakened by the screams of a child, shots, and the barking of a dog. They rushed to the open window, upstairs window to look out at the drama unfolding below. We saw Russell chasing the girl Dorothy down the street, the Reverend Comrade said. The girl seemed to have escaped from the back door and had run into the street going west. She fell two or three times. Russell was only a few feet behind her. How the girl ever escaped is a mystery to us. John Sutter, who lived two doors down at 214 Progress Avenue, ran from the house and called, What are you doing, man? I'm a crazy man, Russell said. Don't stop me. When Sutter ran between the girl and Russell, he scooped her up and into his home. Russell returned to his own house, where the rest of the family already lay dead or wounded and resumed loading his guns. Neighbors said they heard shots that sounded like someone hammering on wood. The whole neighborhood woke up and people drifted into the yards to get a closer look at the commotion. Many walked over to Russell's house to get a closer look. Sheriff, Deputy Sheriff Wesley G. Woolsen, a captain during World War I, lived a block over from the Russell home at 343 Progress. The shooting woke up his wife Gertrude, and she roused her husband, who dressed hurriedly and ran to the scene. Although someone had already called the police, they had not yet arrived, and Woolsen found the neighbors gathered around the house, screaming at Russell to stop, but no one dared to enter. Russell was still shooting his pistols as Woolsen tried the doors and windows. The house was mostly dark, and he couldn't see in, but Russell could apparently see out. I know you, Woolsen, he said. The deputy sheriff, still trying to gauge the situation, tried to humor him. Come on out, Woolsen said. People will think you're crazy. I am crazy, Russell cried. Look, I'm going to shoot the clock. Several shots rang out. Hamilton Police Department officers Robert Leonard and Lewis Keller arrived at the scene and knocked on the front door. Wait till I shoot the damn pictures off the wall, Russell yelled, and he began firing again. Woolsen wasn't counting but later he estimated hearing between 30 and 40 shots. Leonard and Keller prepared tear gas bombs as Russell began to talk incoherently about the mortgage. Leonard, recognizing the possibility that Russell was not only distraught but out of his mind, pulled several bills from his pocket saying, it's all right, we're here to settle the mortgage for you. Then Russell said he was going to kill himself. The deputy and the two patrolmen broke down the door as Russell fired his final shot. The three men watched Russell sink to the floor. One of the revolvers, still smoking and containing four unfired cartridges, dropped from his grasp. I believe I missed my own heart, he gasped. Kill me, kill me. <coughs> Wilson and the patrolman noticed dozens of empty shell casings littering the house. I did a damn poor job on myself, Russell said as a patrolman removed him from the scene and escorted him to the county jail. Russell told the officers, officers that Dorothy, one of the children, escaped. Woolsen, he said, tell Dorothy that I love her. Take care of her. Woolsen walked through the house, every room giving evidence of Russell's carnival of death, as the papers called it. Woolsen noted that there were no bullet holes in the clocks, pictures, or walls. He presumed that Russell had continued pumping shots into the already lifeless bodies of the eight members of the household. On a bed in the front room, John Lowell Russell, his wife Emma Russell, and baby son Richard lay dead, all with bullets in their hearts, apparently shot in their sleep. Slumped off to one side of the bed and partially on the floor was Julia Rose Russell, 13, who also had bullets in her heart as well as other parts of her body. George Francis Russell, six, had evidently attempted to crawl beneath the bed to escape the enraged uncle, but was stopped halfway under. In all my experiences in the trenches and battlefields of France, I never saw a sight more ghastly than the Russell home this morning, Wilson said. There was one eyewitness, a large golden-haired doll. It sat on a chair by the bed in which little Dorothy slept. It was Dorothy's dolly and through all the confusion was not disturbed. Paul Lewis Russell, three years old, was found dead on the floor of the other room, and Woolsen found Robert dead beneath the bicycle. 
In the front, in the rear room, the murderer's mother, Rose Russell, 60 years old, lie dead. Her body riddled with more than eight bullets, including one that pierced her heart, put there by her son, Francis Lloyd Russell. Russell arrived at the jail gasping for breath, holding his hand over the wound in his chest. Sheriff Luther Everson took charge of the prisoner. Russell begged for a glass of water, and within minutes he recovered his composure and gave the sheriff a clear story of the tragedy. Sheriff detectives took down the confession as Russell repeatedly asked for water. I had the best brother in the world, he told the sheriff. He spoke of his mother and recalled that she was born in 1866. His father, Wellington Russell, he said, dropped dead while employed at the Champion Coated Paper Company a few years earlier. Russell knew the exact ages of his nieces and nephews and every birthday. Russell told the sheriff that he had a $1,600 mortgage due on his home that day and that being forced to move weighed heavily on his mind. The intense heat of the early summer wasn't helping matters any. The interview was interrupted by the visit of Dr. M. F. Vereker in lieu of taking the prisoner to a hospital. After the examination, Dr. Vereker said that the wound was not fatal. He probed but was unable to find the bullet believing that the ball struck a bone and became embedded in a fleshy portion of the body. Later, the doctor would ask him why he didn't shoot himself in the head. I was always told that the heart was the weakest place for a man of my stature, he said, and that any little shock would cause the heart to fail. At 10 a.m., Hamilton's acting chief of police, Charles Morton, sent officers to escort Russell from the jail to police headquarters. By this time, however, the loss of blood, exacerbated no doubt by the probing of Dr. Barriker as he searched for the bullet, had made Russell extremely weak. He told them his name, age, and address, but when police began to question Russell about what time he went to bed the previous night, his head sank to his chest, unable to answer. Blood now flowed freely from the wound. Chief Morton ordered officers to return the man to jail for further medical attention. The bullet was lodged in the left side of Russell's chest, barely missing his heart. The doctor told me that if I had fired a little to one side, I would have made it, was Russell's only comment. By making it, we presume he meant to kill himself. Coroner Hugh Gadd sealed off the cottage on Progress Avenue as he and Sheriff Everson searched the house for more clues and the Russell family's legal documents, as Russell told detectives that he carried insurance on the children. There wasn't much disagreement from the law enforcement officials involved that Russell was insane. There was no desire on the part of the state to place the slayer on trial for murder, prosecuting attorney P.O. Bowles said that next day. The very nature and circumstances of the act create a strong presumption of insanity, Bowles said. He declared that he would not demand a grand jury investigation, but would permit Russell's case to be disposed of at a lunacy hearing in probate court. Only Butler County Coroner Hugh Gadd protested that the murder was clearly premeditated and carried out by Russell after continuous brooding over financial worries and the thought of separation from the five children of his brother. It could all have been a moot point. For the entire day and night following the murders, Russell lay on a cot in his narrow padded cell at the county jail to see his few visitors, otherwise keeping his thoughts to himself. Beyond the statement he made in his first confessions, he did not comment on the crime. Just before noon, Russell received his first visitors, cousin Jenny Rathgerber and her husband Boyd out of Loveland, Ohio. They learned of Russell's trouble through newspaper stories. Boyd recognized her and called her Aunt Jenny. This has been going on for a week, he told her. My boy, she said, what made you do this? Because I couldn't stand to lose my home and the children said. Sunday, I went out to the country, he said. I was exhausted and lay down beside the b &O railroad track. I wasn't able to work Monday and Tuesday from worry, and I couldn't sleep. I haven't slept for a week. I don't know what I've been doing this past week. Sheriff Epperson questioned him Thursday afternoon about the motive for the crime. Russell at first hesitated, then replied, I couldn't bear to see the dear little children turned out into the street. I love them, the sweet little children. 
He also expressed regret that he had not seen, sent Dorothy to heaven with, with the rest of them. His energy waned through the day, both from the gunshot wound and from the mental anguish he felt, but not from guilt over what he had done, just regret that he had not finished the job. He received another visitor around 10 p.m. Thursday, Sylvester E. Davis, a lifelong friend and schoolmate. I am not sorry for what I did, Russell told Davis. They are just where I want them to be. The only thing is that there should be two more down there where they are. Russell seemed to rebound a little after Davis's visit, but late afternoon the next day, he took a turn for the worse. Sheriff Epperson again summoned Dr. Barriker to, to make another examination. Barriker said his condition was not as favorable as it had been that morning, and admitted that the self-inflicted bullet wound above Russell's heart still might prove fatal. The sheriff suggested removing Russell to Mercy Hospital, where he might have constant medical attention, but Barriker advised that he be kept in the jail until he got better. Epperson appointed two prisoners to guard Russell and to take care of him through the night. Fellow prisoners heeded Sheriff's request to avoid any no noise and confusion so that the wounded man might spend a quiet night. In the cell next to him sat William Mobus, charged with first-degree murder in connection with the slaying of his wife. Lloyd Russell seemed morose, his features expressionless. He frequently asked for water, but wasn't able to drink until he brought him a straw as well. Once during the night and early the next morning, he asked for ice cream, and the sheriff furnished it. One of his guards fed him, and he swallowed it with apparent relish. Ah, it's cool, Russell exclaimed. It's the best thing you can get me. Whenever they tried to give him soup or solid food, however, Russell turned his head away and muttered, too weak, too weak. He was restless but could not turn in his cot. Fellow prisoners helped him sit in the chair for a while, but the exertion caused his wound to bleed, and after a few minutes, he was taken back to his cot. Dr. Barriker came in to see him again on Friday morning. The man has recovered somewhat from his madness of yesterday, he told the Daily News, but he was, is without a doubt insane. He is some sort of dementia precox and has the illusion that he wants to kill everyone, especially those he loves, to relieve himself of the difficulties in which he finds himself. He will live, the doctor said, but his wound is serious. The bullet struck a rib and deflected into the thorax cavities of the body without touching any of the blood vessels. We dare not probe for the bullet, which is probably at the base of the lung. Chief Morton again had Russell moved to the police station from the jail for more questioning, but he gave up because although Russell was calm and conscious, he was so weak from the loss of blood that he could not speak coherently. Morton did, didn't think that it mattered and sent him back to the jail where he was transferred from the padded cell he had been in to a private cell on the second floor. Should he be adjudged insane in the probate court on the warrant now pending, he said, there shall be no necessity for questioning him at all. Sheriff Epperson ordered that no one be allowed to visit Russell on Friday because of his weak condition. Dr. A.B. Smedley performed the only autopsy in the case Friday morning on the body of eight-year-old Robert, ruling that his death was caused by shock and hemorrhage. Smedley said the boy in all likelihood lived three to four minutes after the shooting. He noted that there were four bullet holes in the boy's chest all within a one-inch circle, meaning that the revolver was held close to, almost up against his body, and the trigger pulled rapidly. The bullet missed his heart by an inch and a half. The autopsy was done at the request of the coroner, Dr. Gad, who said that an autopsy on all the bodies would be an additional and unwarranted expense to the county, so it was the only one never performed. Friday night, the temperatures grew even hotter, and the prisoners the, prison, the prisoner aides kept cold bandages on Russell's head. The jail was stifling hot, and between the temperature and the fever that coursed through his body, Russell was clammy with perspiration, so they gave him a sponge bath to keep his temperature down. Finally, the guards asked Epperson if they could move his cot into a, cor a jail corridor where it was cooler, but by then, Russell seemed to rebound some. 
It didn't take investigators long to discover that the children would not have been turned out into the street after all, that Lloyd's worries about his death had been unfounded. John and Emma had already made arrangements to move into the house of their friend Sylvester Davis on Warwick Avenue, just a few blocks toward the river at the foot of Prospect Hill. Lowell had spent Wednesday evening at Davis's house, doing some odd jobs and repairs before returning to Progress Avenue around 9 p.m. Russell, Russell always also had assurance from his mortgage holders that the financial matters could be arranged satisfactorily with an extension of three years. Cincinnati woman Mrs. E.J. Muntz, widow of the man who built the house and holder of the mortgage, had already written Russell and made an appointment to meet him in Hamilton on that day to grant the extension by refinancing it with a loan from the West Side uh, Building and Loan Association. To Mrs. Muntz's mind, the, the affair would have been settled that afternoon. Mrs. Muntz presented a letter that she had received just the week prior from Lloyd, thanking her for the offer to refinance the debt. It was more than kind of you, he wrote. My mother wants to thank you as well as myself. We are certainly glad of this opportunity to hold on to our home. Even Russell could not explain why he did not carry out with this plan. On Friday, he had more visitors, cousins from Otsego, Michigan, Carl, Wesley, and Forrest Rickenbach. Russell recognized two of them. There, was a, there were women in the party, and Russell said that he wished they hadn't come. They told Russell they drove all night to get there. Be careful, don't get hit by autos, Russell told them. His jailer still tried to get him to eat something other than ice cream. But Russell said he could live on his fat. Since they put him in the county jail, he hadn't left his cot, though the attendants who bathed him said he seemed brighter and stronger. He expressed no desire to attend the funeral of his victims. The bodies of Lloyd, Emma, and the children were placed for visitation at the funeral parlor of W.F. Cahill and Sons on Dayton Street, just across from St. Stephen's Church on Friday afternoon. The six open caskets were arranged in a semicircle. Baby Richard was laid in the arms of his, of his mother in a steel gray coffin identical to her husband's. The caskets of the children were all white, identical except for the nameplate that identified each one. A dozen lamps gave the parlor an eerie, pale glow. Among the many tributes were a large purple and white arrangement from the Moose Lodge and a giant floral wheel from the Ford Motor Company. The Daily News estimated that 10,000 people visited the mortuary that evening, lining up around the corner on 2nd Street, up Market, and back down 3rd Street as far as Buckeye, three and four deep on the sidewalk and spilling out into the street. The Evening Journal had a more modest estimate of 5,000. Many people reported making several trips to the mortuary, but after taking a look at the crowd, decided to come and return later, only to see that the line was growing stronger. The hedges and shrubs in front of the mortuary were destroyed, and people tried to sneak in through the garage door. Men and women alike fought for position and a good vantage point, and children were trampled when the doors opened at 4 p.m., the heat of the evening making it all that more uncomfortable and intense. Three city policemen did their best to control the crowd. Dorothy had been sent to stay with an aunt, identified as Mrs. Frank Smith, Across, the town, across town on Westview Avenue. Her aunt and other relatives accompanied her to the funeral parlor, parlor Friday evening to see her family, but she was overwhelmed by the crowd of people and collapsed on the sidewalk. She braved on, however, but sobbed audibly without speaking as she cast one last look at her family. The crowd continued to stream through the mortuary until 12.20 a.m. Mr. Cahill said he didn't get home until 2 a.m then started getting calls at 5 a.m. from people asking when the doors would be open Saturday morning. He opened early, and people again filed through the mortuary until the bells started tolling to begin the funeral mass. The nuns from St. Peter's School, teachers of the Russell's children, led a procession of students past the coffins. There was not a dry-eyed child in line, the newspaper said, and many small breasts were heaving as they caught a glimpse of their schoolmates laid out in death. There was a similar scene, though not quite as large, across the river at Webb Funeral Parlor, where hundreds of members of the fraternal organizations Rose belonged to turned out for the visitation. 
the Lone Star Temple, the Pythian Sisters, Silver Lake, Daughters of Rebecca, and Daughters of America all held services at the Beard. The degree of Pocahontas, for whom Rose was a district officer, would hold graveside services the next day. Because Emma Russell was a devout Catholic and was raising the children that way, a solemn requiem mass was held Saturday morning at St. Stephen's Church for Lowell and his family. Lacking room for the coffins, however, the bodies just lay in the funeral parlor at W.F.K. Hill and Sons across the street. A catafalque was set up in the altar to represent the coffins. A children's choir sang for the church, which was filled almost to capacity. Dorothy sat in the front row with her aunts and other relatives. Father Joseph Hare, pastor of St. Peter's Church, where the Russells were members, served as the celebrant. His talk was based on the scripture, Watch, therefore, for you don't know the hour for the day. We are called upon today to perform sad duties, he said, to lay to rest, to convey to Mother Earth the remains of a father, a mother, and all but one of their children. It is indeed sorrowful to do this duty because it was so sudden. Dayton Street was closed for the event, and four hearses blocked the way. Police tried desperately to keep a path open between the church and the funeral parlor and from the funeral parlor to the hearses. The streets were filled, however, as many people didn't go into the church so as not to relinquish their vantage point for seeing the bodies removed. It was one mass of humanity, the Daily News reported, as the procession moved from the church to the mortuary. Members of the family were the only people admitted to the funeral home after the service. Lily Long, one of Emma's sisters, cried, Oh, Emma, oh, the baby, and seemed to be on the verge of collapsing before others helped her to a chair to regain her composure. Bull's brothers at the Royal Order of Moose volunteered to be his pallbearers. Relatives would carry the coffin containing Emma and baby Richard, while classmates at St. Peter's School would bear the other children. After the Mass, Three police officers accompanied the procession to St. Stephen's Cemetery and maintained order the best they could, but commands to stand back were ignored, and the pallbearers had to push their way through. The children were placed side by side in a ten-foot by six-foot grave, while Lowell, Emma, and Richard were placed in a hole six feet wide and seven and a half feet long. Rosa's funeral was set for Saturday afternoon, and her interment in, it was in Greenwood Cemetery, next to her husband, Wellington. After the funerals, Dorothy went to stay with another aunt, Liana Spurl, on Heaton Street. Meanwhile, in the county jail, Russell's strength returned on Saturday, and he broke his fast by eating some soup and some other food. His recovery was assured, the Evening Journal reported, but he had not yet left his cot. On Monday, Deputy Woolson took a crack at questioning Russell, but Russell said he remembers nothing of the confusion, although he did remember shooting himself. Why didn't you shoot me, Woolson asked. Why would I shoot you, Russell said, perplexed. You haven't done anything to me. On Tuesday, June 9th, the probate court awarded custody of Dorothy, who had been removed to Dayton to get away from the madness here in Hamilton, to her aunt Mabel Becker of Benninghoffen Avenue, and it was determined that the estates of her parents, valued at around $4,000, chiefly from insurance, would be hers. Coroner Gadd scheduled an inquest for Saturday, June 13th, adhering to his belief that the act was premeditated. Acting Police Chief Morton, even though in visiting Russell believed him to be insane, said he would delay pressing murder charges until after the inquest. Detectives, however, found that Russell had recently purchased one of the two revolvers at a North 3rd Street pawn shop, lending credibility to the premeditation theory. Saturday, June, 9, June 13, nine days after his terrible crime, Francis Lloyd Russell attended a coroner's inquest where he would stand face to face with the only surviving member of his family, nine-year-old Dorothy. Several witnesses testified before Dorothy was brought to the coroner. Dr. Smedley, who examined the bodies, said he believed the crimes were premeditated, although he refused to express an opinion on the man's sanity. Each of the victims were shot through or in the vicinity of the heart, Dr. Smedley said, and powder burns on the body showed the weapon had been fired at very close range. 
Dr. Smedley drew the conclusion that Russell planned to kill each family member by shooting them through their hearts. Other bullets found in the bodies were fired at random, in his opinion. When it was her turn to enter the courtroom, Dorothy trembled and said that she was afraid to face her uncle. Only when assured that Russell was heavily guarded was she persuaded to enter the room, and then only when told when she could sit in the lap of her aunt and appointed guardian, Mabel Becker. Dorothy entered the courtroom by a side door, the Evening Journal reported. When Russell saw her, he looked at her but for an instant. His face twitched, his hands clenched the arms of his chair, and he shifted his gaze. After that, he did not look at her once during the hearing. It was the first time they had seen each other since he chased her from her bed that early into the early morning street. The meeting came as a surprise to Russell, as it had been staged by Coroner Gad, still convinced that the whole episode had been planned to observe the prisoner's reaction. The coroner considered Dorothy's testimony crucial to the case and was certain that he would return a verdict of premeditated first-degree murder against Russell. Dorothy's lips quivered as she spoke from her aunt's lap, her large blue eyes filled with tears. For several minutes, her entire body shook, but as the questioning proceeded, she became calmer, occasionally throwing glances at her uncle, who sat surrounded by sheriff deputies just 20 feet away. At Russell's slightest move, she would nearly jump from her aunt's lap, and several times it appeared to spectators that she was preparing to run from the scene. He didn't like Mama very well, Dorothy testified when asked about relations in the Russell home. She said that her uncle's disposition changed noticeably after the last child, Richard, was born four months prior. Russell only looked at the baby once after its birth, Dorothy said. Whenever any of the children held the infant, Dorothy said Lloyd would yell at them. He was cross and irritable, she said, especially when her father was not around. She said he frequently struck at the other children. Dorothy recalled one occasion when her uncle was eating breakfast and spilled coffee. She said that he became very angry and cursed the first time she ever heard him use profanity. She said he would become irritable when he came home from work and his meals were not prepared. Lowell and Lloyd would often argue, and Dorothy said that Emma recently remarked that she could not put up with Lloyd's conduct much longer. The night before the tragedy, he sat on the porch with other members of the family and was in good spirits, Dorothy told the coroner. She also testified that her uncle purchased a revolver shortly before the tragedy. Sheriff Epperson said that when he returned Russell to his cell, the prisoner seemed indifferent to his fate and said he would have been willing to testify had he been called. A throng of curious people lined the path as Russell was brought from his cell to the jail to probate Judge Gideon Palmer's courtroom Friday morning, June 19th, two weeks after the murders. The courtroom was likewise jammed with spectators. Russell appeared haggard and worn. He did not smile or show any emotion. His hands twitched constantly, and at times his head would bob up and down, seemingly beyond his control, possibly caused by the lack of sleep. Otherwise, he did not move but just stared at the judge. Dr. Mark Milliken was the first to testify, and he told the court that on Wednesday, in company with Dr. E. F. P. Zerfus, he conducted a half-hour examination of Russell to determine whether or not the man was sane. Palmer asked his opinion of Russell's mental condition, and Dr. Milliken replied that he believed that at the time of the examination, the man was insane. Pressed by Judge Palmer, Dr. Milliken related some of the facts which led him to that opinion including that Russell had shown no sign of remorse. Russell was an ardent reader, Dr. Milliken reported. He read extensively of poems, and his favorite poem being James Whitcomb Riley. He liked children, Milliken said, but not the fondle. One of his particular delights was to tell riddles to the youngsters. Russell attempts to deliver the impression that the shooting, to him, is a blank, Milliken said. He told me that he knew nothing of the shooting and that he remembers nothing prior to the time when Deputy Sheriff Wesley G. Woolson knocked on the door of Progress Avenue and shouted, here is money for the mortgage. According to the next witness, Dr. Zerfus, Russell was an extremely self-satisfied man and had an inkling of what he was going to do, 
as evidenced by the purchase of the handguns several days before the shooting. What, in your opinion, is the condition of the mind of Russell at the time of the tragedy and now, from the examinations and observations from the history of the matter? Asked Prosecutor Ball. Zerfus answered, I believe him insane now and at the time of the crime. Dr. Barriker said that, the jail physician, that as the jail physician, he had observed Russell many times beginning on the day of the shooting when he had said that the slaying of his relatives was his mission in life. When he asked Russell why he did not kill himself and let the others live, Russell replied that his mother would be left. Asked why he did not kill himself and mother only, he replied that the others would be left. Russell said that he had bungles, bungled his attempts to kill Dorothy and to kill himself. Barriker said he had no hesitancy in believing that Russell was insane. A sane man knows that by killing all that are near and dear to him to thereby, to thereby fulfill a mission in life, is a fixed delusion, he said. Judge Palmer then interrogated Russell briefly. Do you know Dr. Milliken? He asked. Not personally, but I remember him coming to see me in the jail, Russell replied. How old are you? I will be 40 years of age on next October 26th. I was born in 1885. Russell then answered several questions about his job. Have you any recollection of the charges against you, Judge Palmer interrogated? I know what I am charged with, Russell replied, evidently misunderstanding the question. Judge Palmer repeated, asking him whether or not he had any recollection of the actual shooting. The only thing I remember, Russell answered slowly and very deliberately, is when they had me in a padded cell. Then someone lighted a cigarette, and that reminded me of the gunpowder, and I remembered something about the shooting. Russell appeared to finally show some emotion, perhaps for the first time since the crimes. Do you feel sorry? Palmer asked. I can see I have tried to keep my mind off of this thing, but Russell trailed off, almost sobbing. It's terrible. It's terrible. And at that, the judge ended the questioning. No one bothered to ask him why he did it. Palmer found Russell insane and unable to stand trial, remanding him to the Lima State Hospital for the criminally insane. One of the prisoners who, who helped tend to them said Russell's health started going downhill again after the insanity hearing. He, his skin lost all color but turned a pale yellow. Jail attendants said that he did not eat more than two or three full meals a week during the rest of his stay at the Butler County Jail and he lost 40 pounds in the three weeks. Fellow prisoners said that he never joined any card games, never spoke unless spoken to, maintained a hesitant air. He slept most of the time. Early in the morning of June 30th, 1925, Francis Lloyd Russell, the self-inflicted bullet still in his chest, shook hands with his fellow prisoners in the Butler County Jail. Sheriff Epperson had kept the event quiet as to avoid any crowds that might gather to see Russell off, so there were few people in the street. You have been good to me, he said. I am grateful for your treatment, but I am glad I'm going away. He didn't eat any breakfast that morning, telling his jailers that the sight of food nauseated him. Sheriff Epperson reported that Russell seemed resigned to his lot. Russell spoke, said very little on the trip to Lima, he said. He demonstrated practically no emotion when he was turned over to hospital authorities. On October that year, in October of that year, West Side Building Alone finally did sue for foreclosure on the house at 220 Progress Avenue for a $3,250 first mortgage that Russell had taken out when he first bought the home. Ella Muntz, the woman who had held the second mortgage that Russell was concerned about, purchased the house at sheriff's sale the following February for $4,600. It had been appraised at $5,000. Dorothy Louise was adopted by George and Mabel Becker and quietly lived out her life in Hamilton. The 1934 senior review of Hamilton High School said, Dot's happy outlook on life makes her cheerful. She was selected by Miss Helen Grismer, Dean of Girls, to be on the 11-member Dean's Council. She was appointed class auditor. 
She had an interest in theater, working as an usher for the senior class plays They All Want Something in November and the four-act comedy Grumpy in the spring. In February 1934, she went upon the stage herself, starring in a play at the Finmont Center, the Catholic Recreation Center near St. Stephen's Church. The play was called Puppy Love, and she starred opposite Bernie Barney Tymeyer in the role of Jean Brent. The story concerned a young man who, failing to win his, the approval of his beloved mother, beloved's mother, hires himself out as a chauffeur to be near her. Although Mr. Tymeyer got his picture in the paper, the paper said that Dorothy, quote, shows great dramatic ability and promises to give a splendid performance. In 1939, she married Lawrence Winter, who was a milk salesman at the time, but would later become a foreman at the Fisher Body Plant in Fairfield. Together, they raised three daughters on Freeman Avenue across from the Pierce Elementary School. She was an active member of St. Joseph Church and the Knights of Columbus Auxiliary. Her husband Larry died in 1976, and Dorothy Louise Russell Becker Winter died April 10, 2005, just a couple months shy of her 90th birthday. Francis Lloyd Russell spent the rest of his days at the Lima State Hospital for the Criminally Insane. He died there of a heart attack on September 23, 1943, at the age of 58. Next on yesterday's news, the gas fume fugitive, the story of Charlie King, a barber new in town who turned the gas on his family in the middle of the night on October 23rd, 1929, hopped a freight train out of town, and wasn't seen again for exactly one year. That will be 7 p.m. November 21st, the Thursday before Thanksgiving, here at Miami Hamilton downtown. And that was yesterday's news. Thank <laughs> you.